Hey, good afternoon. Welcome to the second of the spring 21 BCT lecture series. So today is the presentation on Boston's mega project, the big dig. So guys, good evening. My name is Fernando Romero and I will be introducing tonight's presentation. For the first time in Sao Paulo, Brazil, I met Dan McNico at the World Project Manager Institute Congress in 2008. He was a keynote guest speaker. It was the first time that I heard about the Big Dig. I remember that uh, his presentations about Big Dig challenge, innovations, construction process, etc., was so impressive. At the end of his presentation, I bought his book and I decided to study Boston's Big Dig. The second time that I met them again was in Belo Horizonte, Brazil. I was working at Vale, a mining company, the second biggest mining company uh, globally. And I invited him to lecture during the open day of Vale, Vale University. One again, once again, all my colleagues and I were impressed with his presentation about Boston Big Dig. Two years ago, I accepted an offer to join the BCT faculty team, and I moved to West, to Hermes. At that time, Dan was living in Boston. I started to think about inviting him to come to UMass to talk about Boston Big Digs. So we are close to Boston. You guys probably heard about Big Digs project, but for sure, not about the complex and challenge. So I hope you guys can feel the same feeling when I came across Big Dig for the first time. Then, welcome to the University of Massachusetts, Hermes, the Building Construction Technology Department. Now, the floor is yours, finally. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Fernando. And it's just remarkable. When you meet someone in, the, in, in Brazil, and then you find that you're gonna be living near them, next door to them in Western Mass, it's a, it's a wonderful serendipitous moment. And thank you, Carl. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Kath, as well, for, for the invite. It's, it's an absolute pleasure and an exciting moment for me to be able to share with you, as Fernando was saying, this complex project, this mega project that so few people know about. But, you know, I, I wanted to say one thing before we launch. It's about infrastructure, really. And it's about the significance of infrastructure that we're hearing a lot more about. I feel like we're in an existential moment who would have guessed? It's, it's something that you wouldn't even dream up in a sci-fi movie, but climate change and all the efforts to become more sustainable really fall on infrastructure. Uh, the Green New Deal is an infrastructure project, really. It's an infrastructure program. So I hope you look at your future in this pivotal moment, this inflection point that we're at, because I think the future really depends on sustainability. And we're, we're well suited here with your faculty to, to capitalize on that and move it forward, which makes for a very exciting career for all, all of you that are, are embarking on one. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna share my screen with you in a moment, but I just wanna just touch on, because we're gonna move quickly and I'm, I'm eager to share with you everything I know about this project and I can't, but I'm gonna hit on the highlights and if there's enough here for a course, a whole program. So we're gonna, in 60 minutes, cover an enormous amount of ground. So forgive me if it's a broad broad brush stroke that we're gonna be using. But at the end, I hope you have some uh, questions and we'll, we'll get into some of the details. And because of COVID, because of the plague, and I have to salute you all. I mean, what, what a time to be in school. Uh, what, a, what a hardship for all of you. And I have a lot of great deal of respect for your courage and sticking out your academic curriculum uh, during this, this really challenging time. But we're gonna talk about the big dig, what is it? We're gonna move into the, the, the politics, you know, civic engineering, public works, it's, it's political. It, it always will be, always has been. Ever since Caesar hit up his senators for the road projects he was building, uh, it's been about politics. So that's unavoidable. But let's talk about the birth of the big dig and then get right into the construction of it. Why, why the Ted Williams Tunnel? Why was that built first? Then we're gonna move into the downtown and talk about the complexities of building in a 400 year old city through narrow alleyways and old brick buildings and digging a massive tunnel project. And then lastly, we're gonna to touch on the, the, the wrap up, the, the conclusion, the final mile really, the link that brings the big dig to its end. And I'd like to just touch on, on that infrastructure initiative as well. Uh, personal note about that before we wrap up. Is that fair? Okay, I'm gonna share my screen with you here. Yeah. 
and we're off. Can everyone see? We're good? Yep, looks good. All right, the big day, what is it? The, the project is, it's almost impossible to see it in Boston. And, and I mean this, like, like most of the, the big dig is below ground. A lot of it's above, but a majority of it is below ground. And the founder of the project, the, the creator of the project, Fred Salvucci said, you know what? People are not gonna even know about this project when it's done, unlike the 800 foot tall Hoover Dam or the Empire State Building. But specifically, it's a civic project. It's a public works project, like the Transcontinental Railroad, on that scale, as far as complexity and cost and initiative. It's like the Panama Canal. As a matter of fact, the man in white, who would be wearing white in a, in a greasy crane and construction, piece of construction equipment, but Teddy Roosevelt. The, the Panama Canal was called the Big Ditch. It was called Teddy's Ditch. And the Big Ditch was the, the origin for the Big Dig. Even its name comes from another great public works project, the Panama Canal and the Hoover Dam. Uh, the, these two projects, the Hoover Dam and the Panama Canal adjusted for inflation, still are together not as expensive as the initiative of the Big Dig. The interstate system, that's what the Big Dig is born from. It is a public works project. More specifically, it's a federal highway project. It's a DOT, a, a Department of Transportation project that, that Mayor, Mayor Pete, Mayor Pete Buttigieg is now in charge of. But the Big Dig was born from two separate projects. The interstate system was the largest project in the history of the world until the Chinese got online and started building their interstate system. I call it the interprovincial system or their high-speed rail system. But the interstate system is, in our country, the largest effort ever undertaken. And it's 50,000 miles of highway, 55,000 bridges, 100 major tunnels. But the big dig was born from that mega project. It's a separate project, a smaller project, but still massive. The entire cost of the big dig, dollar for dollar, costs as much as all of I-95. Uh, that's a, an enormous chunk of highway. And, the Big Dig is not, it's only seven miles long. It's 161 lane miles. It covers the corners of, the Bo of Boston. Boston proper is a very small city and the Big Dig covered every corner of it. The Big Dig became synonymous with Boston and Boston became synonymous with the Big Dig. They were kind of one and the same for about 20 years. But the Big Dig's name, the official name in Washington was the Central Artery slash Third Harbor Tunnel Project a long name that only a government official could really get behind, hence the Big Dig name stuck. But the downtown, 93, that is the central artery part. The Third Harbor Tunnel was the Ted Williams Tunnel. So the Third Harbor Tunnel, central artery project is the, is the focus. The, the Big Dig can be, you know, if a, if a picture is a thousand words, the video is 10,000. So let me just rip this video for you, it's 30 seconds. And it'll give you a sense of the most spectacular component of the Big Dig, the downtown, the elevated highway. Uh, Reaganites in Washington were calling it Michael Dukakis's beautification project. Michael Dukakis was the governor at the time. He launched this initiative and it was seen by them as, as an unnecessary component, but really it's the most important part for Bostonians. Washingtonians were more concerned about the I-90 connection, connecting the interstate to the international airport. But if you go down below, these parks, after the highway was torn down and the highway below is massive. It's massive on any scale. And we're gonna talk more about the specifics of that. But really the big dig is the correction of a project that went terribly wrong. In the 1950s, the Department of Public Works, a state organization for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, launched a $110 million project that was part of a 1948 master plan. And this plan said the concrete, the steel, it's going to smash gridlock. It's going to create the highway in the skies. And it was really far from the truth. Uh, here's the project director of the Central Artery. It gives you an idea of where we're going with this. But this man loved to blow things up. He loved to bulldoze homes. And he, every building in this picture, for example, was decimated by his initiative to build this artery through the downtown of Boston. 65 acres were wiped out and thousands of, of families and homes were displaced. By 1954, the project began in 51, 
By 54, they stopped construction. They said, this is a mistake, this elevated highway. Even back then, when everyone seemed to want highways, this was seen as a mistake. It stopped right here in 1954, right by the, the Daniel Hall marketplace, roughly. And it was decided even back then to put it in a tunnel. And Parsons Brinkerhoff, at the time, the design firm, built, designed, I should say, this tunnel that was built. It was the widest highway tunnel ever built in the world. And it was seen as the solution to finishing the project. That gave the impetus for putting the entire thing underground. The highway failed from the very beginning. It had 27 off and on ramps, way, no such thing as limited access on this highway because limited access allows more traffic to flow through. This was literally a parking lot. And it wasn't all Callahan's fault. The project was left incomplete, incomplete. The, the other parts of the highway plan were not finished. So all this uh, disconnection and all these highways feeding into the central artery just dumped on it and, and no, nothing ever flowed or worked properly from the very beginning. It was pre-interstate, pre-understanding of just exactly what would be required to build limited access highways. You know, in the downtowns, a mile apart between off and on ramps is required by the Federal Highway Administration. In the rural areas, three miles. Look what the central artery did. It's like someone took their hand and cut off all their fingers. Oh, the Boston's core emanated from the core and, and pushed out to the, the piers and the wharves. And this highway cut the core, the hub of Boston, off from the waterfront. It literally was a 40 foot wall, two miles long, that severed Boston from its historic waterfront. These two men come along. On the left, as you're looking at the screen is Michael Dukakis, the governor who launched the construction of the, of the big dig. But behind Michael Dukakis, literally figuratively, is Fred Salvucci. He's a professor at MIT, he's an engineer, he's a politician. And he is the one who pushed this project forward. Ralph Waldo Emerson, the great thinker from the 1800s said, all history is biography and this story belongs to Fred Salvucci. It's really his creation that we can thank for a much improved Boston. And I, I trace this back. I was working with National Geographic and we traced this, this important meeting back to this pub, <laughs> right? We're in Boston. Uh, it's appropriate to have a, a barroom meeting on the back of a napkin. Literally, these two gentlemen, Fred Salvucci on the left, a, a man named Bill Reynolds on the right, Bill Reynolds, a pro-highway man, approached Fred Salvucci, who with a lot of help had just stopped the construction of I-95 from coming into the city. And to think that he had the gall as a pro-highway person to call on this anti-highway man and say, I've got a great idea for this highway in the, in the downtown. Well, let's put it underground. And maybe by 1976, because this is a reenactment of a meeting that took place in 1971, we'll get this whole thing underground. Well, Barney Frank, a congressman at the time said, wouldn't it be cheaper just to raise the city instead of lower the artery? The politics in Washington allowed for this project to move forward, though the planets were aligned and Massachusetts had this opportunity. On the right is Tip O'Neill, the very, very powerful speaker of the house in charge of all of, of, the, of the house. He famously would joke with Ronald Reagan, they, they, they locked horns. It was great political theater, not like the hate that you see now in Washington, but more cordial, still adversarial, but they were very, very uh, amiable and able to work together. And then the lion of the Senate, Ted Kennedy, the brother of John F. Kennedy, really put the clamp on the, on the passing of the legislation, the, the transportation bill that gave birth to the big dig over Ronald Reagan, a very powerful, very popular president. They were able to override his veto on April 1st, April Fool's Day, believe it or not. And then at the signing, Ronald Reagan said, I have never seen more pork in all my life, not since I handed out blue ribbons at the Iowa State Fair. And that was the birth of the big dig. That was when everything began for real in Boston. Now, geotechnically, let's take a look at what we're gonna be going through. This is Boston Harbor. This is Boston Harbor when the first Europeans came in to settle it. They, they sailed past this peninsula. 
That green spot is Boston Common, for any of you that know, that's 48 acres. The entire island, and it was an island at high tide, was only 600 acres or so. And at low tide, there was a peninsula, a connection. But this is where the fresh water was. This is where Boston began. And the Big Dig was going to build 98% of its project through water because 70% of Boston is man-made. It's horrific. It's the worst fill material to build in heavy tunnels, he heavy bridges, all in water. This is more of a subaqueous than a subterranean project. The yellow is the original landmass, and almost all of the big dig goes through the black, which was the land that was filled in. And when I say filled in, they took old ships and scuttled them. They took debris from the great fire of 1872. They threw in anything they could get their hands in to make land. They actually called it that. They called it land making. So geotechnically, this project was a challenge and it was the largest geotechnical investigation before a project was to launch. They mapped out the project. They took literally old maps from the 17, 1800s from the Boston Public Library and lay them out over construction drawings like this one. This was the official map. 116 mega construction projects and some of them truly mega, like a billion dollars and over. A lot of them hundreds of, hundreds of millions of dollars. All of them linking up. There were fewer design projects, more construction projects, and that was a way to see to the management of this massive project. Eight linear miles, roughly, half of that in tunnel, 161 lane miles of of project. So why did they start in the harbor first? Well, there were two projects here, right? The I-90 part, which is the blue one, the Ted Williams Tunnel, and then the I-93, the downtown. And the Washingtonians were saying, no, we want the connection to the airport. What was the fear? I can tell you, I was, I was on the staff at the project at the time on the big dig. We were concerned that they were going to cut us off. We were going to build this great tunnel to the airport. And then they were going to say, OK, we're not going to bother with the rest of the project. And then the 93 part, the part that Bostonians really wanted, especially Michael Dukakis, that was not going to happen if we, if we weren't careful, because the project broke very evenly and cleanly. There. Anyway, the project begins in the late 80s. They start doing all sorts of geotechnical investigations. And then this thing comes through the Panama Canal from, from out west in the San Francisco area, the bay. And it starts digging a 50 foot deep trench. At high tide, the water is about 40 feet. So the bucket would go through 40 feet of water, hit the bottom and dig a 50 foot deep trench. 4,500 barges of material landed up going out onto Spectacle Island as a place to store this material that was dug up. These sections, 12 of them, this is a picture of one of them at the Bethlehem Steel Shipyard in Baltimore, Maryland. They were shipped up literally from the shipyard, floating steel hulks. They're called binocular tubes, immersed tube tunnel sections on top of this barge. And you can see the like binocular tubes is what they also call them. Each barrel has two lanes of traffic in it. They're about 85 feet wide, 40 feet high, 325 feet long. This is inside one of those binocular tubes. And you can see uh, Clifford Holland, who built the Holland Tunnel, first vehicle tunnel in the world built with ventilation. You can see his, his footprint here. His, it, it, the, the road deck is being built, but below is an air plenum for fresh air, and the exhausted air will go out of plenum in the top. In the top, you can see a skylight. That's where materials, trucks, men, women came into and out of. They sealed it. They reached negative buoyancy, and it was a big deal at the time. Uh, now your iPhone can do this, but using satellite technology, lasers, GPS systems to lower the sections down one at a time. And just a footnote, that's an artistic liberty. That, that diver was not down there directing traffic. You can't even see three feet in front of you in Boston Harbor. This is the section, the first section that was brought up from Baltimore in the mud down below with its air plenums and it's ready to go. So it's where a marine tunnel, these 12 steel sections end to end, get connected to the land tunnels on either end. The largest circular coffer dam where off to the right, the land tunnel is meeting off to the left, the immersed tube tunnel section. You can see two snorkels on the lower left. Those are air shafts and that's also where supplies and equipment went up and down. Why a circular coffer dam? Contractor said, if you let me build a circular coffer dam instead of the square one, rectangular one I'm being forced to build, 
we can build a more efficient system that will speed up our construction project and we'll be able to deliver this for less money. And we, as, as the idea maker of this concept, it's called value engineering, we'll be able to save, you know, we'll be able to partake in some of that savings. It's an incentive program and it worked very well in this case. The circular coffer dam was left open. It was able to speed up construction. If it had been a rectangular coffer dam, we would have been dealing with those buttresses you see across the land tunnel coming into it. And those would have slowed construction down considerably. So the land tunnel finally lands up over in East Boston at the International Airport. A very important part of the interstate system that this big dig is a part of is to connect capitals, state capitals and government, connect city populations and modes of transportation like Logan International. And it was pretty much a brutal path to get to Logan before the Ted Williams Tunnel. Now, speaking of politics, and, and when I came up from Washington to work on the Big Dig, I worked at the White House on transportation policy and I came to the Big Dig and my boss was the project director and he said, Dan, be careful in Boston, people hate you for real. They, it's a blood sport politics. Well, here you have a Republican governor and he's dying to name this tunnel after someone popular in his world. Who knew Ted Williams was a Republican? He was and is you know, in the, in the eyes of history. So Governor Weld at the time, right there, the redhead they called him, he said, why don't we name it after the sports hero? Uh, I think it's <laughs> genius. And who would have guessed that a, a tunnel would be named after uh, a great slugger, Ted Williams, with his knitted hat right there. The Ted Williams Tunnel was beautiful when it opened up. It was built to its full specifications. The, the tiling, the interiors, the architectural accoutrements, the exterior, as well, the, these beautiful ventilation buildings harkening back, I think to the great Art Deco periods like the Hoover Dam built with beauty in mind. This, this building is a massive ventilation building, 14 huge fans pulling air out, big fans pulling air in. But things like this were taken off these projects, taken off these vent buildings throughout the city. The Big Dig built the largest ventilation system in the world, eight different buildings. The stainless steel caps, for example, though, were some of the architectural accoutrements that were removed as part of cost containment, which I, I, I just cringe when I think of that. That's not containing the cost. That's not completing the project. And you start ripping off the architectural finishes. But look at that. It's majestic, isn't it? It's so massive. And that's the air intake part that sits on the tarmac at Logan International Airport. All right, so, so for the downtown, the, the 93 component, now that was seen as, as the real driver for the, the, the project. That was what really got things started. The 90 piece was an add-on and it was Tip O'Neill, that famous and powerful speaker of the house who said, why not both? Let's build both. There was a real argument in the project in the, in the run up to the construction of can we do one or the other? We can't do both possibly. And Tip O'Neill was really the one who said, we can do both. And understandably the downtown tunnel is now named after Tip O'Neill. But this, this tunnel is complex. This is where things got very difficult. I would even say ugly in some cases. This is the elevated highway going through the downtown. This is the mistake from the 1950s that's being corrected in the project's eyes. This elevated highway was supported entirely during its construction, during the construction of the tunnel down below. That was another first in engineering history that such a massive structure over a mile and a half long carrying 200,000 vehicles roughly a day could be supported while a bigger tunnel below was built. That's part of what you would call mitigation, demanding, Governor Dukakis demanded that the highway be left open. And you know what? He wouldn't have gotten the political approvals that he did from his constituents and other politicians had he said, we're gonna shut the city down. Uh, that just was not on the table. So this is the path of the tunnel. And I find it fascinating because as the latecomer to Boston's infrastructure, the Big Dig had to make its way around other existing infrastructure. So off to the left, it comes down at a, at a pitch, a grade that exceeds the maximum allowed by federal highway, a variance was gotten. It goes underneath the blue line, it goes underneath the red line subway built in 1912. It's 150 feet deep. It's the deepest piece of infrastructure in Boston at about 150 feet down. It goes underneath the red line climbs and goes over the blue line tunnel you can see that blue line tunnel is very close to the surface our big dig tunnel passed over the blue line 
and only had about three feet of clearance at the top where State Street exists and the, and the surface street exists. It went back down, picked up two older tunnels, the Sumner and Callahan tunnels, and then it made its exit onto the widest cable stay bridge in the world. When you're digging through an area like Boston, you're, you're required, federal requirements to exhume artifacts. If you can leave them alone and avoid them, that's, that's the mandate. But if you cannot avoid them, you must exhume them and preserve them. And as a result, Boston got its largest archeological dig ever and learned a great deal about itself in the process. Rats, people were scared to death because there was hype. People against the project said, rats are gonna come crawling out of nowhere when they start pounding the earth going to come up to you through your toilets. They're going to be all over the city. The city's going to be taken over by rats. Time Magazine ran a big story about it. Connie Chung, this famous reporter at the time, was talking about it in the news. Not good for Boston's image. And Fred Salucci finally went to the business leaders and said, you, you've got to put, a, put the stop to this. It's going to, it's going to do more damage than good. So these are the kind of the obstacles. And these are the things that are required of a public project today. The Green Monster at Fenway was the nickname of the highway as well. And the green monster had to be held open while the tunnel went down below. Utilities had to be relocated. And then when they were touched and opened up, they had to be upgraded. So 29 miles of major lines, major trunk lines of gas and water and sewage were replaced. And then 500, excuse me, 5,000 miles of fiber optic were laid down, which was a big deal in the 1990s. And this, all this work is going on in 1995, 96, 97. The, the big dig started in 87 with the passage. In 90, it was really a, the beginning of the utility relocation. 92 was the construction of the Ted Williams Tunnel. 95 is when they finally got to the downtown. The project was about half finished in 1999. But utility so those black lines are the tunnel lines and the yellow lines are the relocated, upgraded utility lines. Part of the mitigation, and when I say mitigation, anything to lessen the impact of the big dig on the public and mitigation cost the big dig about a third of its budget. So at 15 billion, which is roughly what it was when it was finished, that's, that's a $5 billion expenditure for supporting the elevated highway, relocating and upgrading utilities, getting rid of the rats and making sure the city is accessible. But the utility relocation was very, very challenging. Working at night is also part of mitigation. So you, you can get on the roads, it speeds up construction, it eliminates a lot of the congestion that's already plaguing Boston, but it costs a lot to, to pay for overtime. All the wheels of all the trucks, a simple thing, but it was required that they all be washed and cleaned before they left construction sites. Temporary structures. You don't think about this, but when you need to keep the city moving, call it business continuation, you, you, you've got to build brand new temporary highways that exceed the strength of the old structures that are replacing. And they're basically permanent structures built for a five, 10 year period. And then keeping the, the businesses open as well and neighborhoods operating and living and thriving. Everybody was chasing this though. This was the carrot at the end of the stick. The, the, the promise of, the, of the, green, the greening of Boston. Uh, this elevated highway had 27 acres of property underneath it. Prime choice, grade A real estate. And it was mostly turned into open space. And here's a shot very vintage graphic of the complexity again. The highway down below, 93, the Red Line subway built in 1912, right above it, a new Silver Line at the time, new Silver Line transitway system above the Red Line, and then a, a, like a plaza, like a lobby for both the, red, the Silver Line and the Red Line. And it, it was so tight that they had to lift Atlantic Avenue and Summer Street, the intersection up by about a foot and a half. Where did this idea though of slurry walls come from? Because slurry walls were the only way we could build this project. And that was something Fred Salvucci had to understand. And Fred being from the Italian descent came across the concept of slurry walls. They were developed by the Italians in the 1940s and 50s. The Milano subway system was built with slurry walls. The largest use of slurry walls in the United States was in 1967. 3,500 linear feet 
3,500 linear feet to build a bathtub to build these two massive, super high, tallest buildings in the world at the time, skyscrapers, the World Trade Center. And that bathtub was outlined with slurry walls. That th those 3,500 feet of slurry walls kept out the Hudson River, just like we wanted to keep out the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so remarkable were those slurry walls that the 9-11 Memorial Museum has a major tribute to these slurry walls, which you see off to the right with, the, with those anchors. Slurry walls on the Big Dig, 26,000 linear feet. That's about five miles, 3,500 in New York. And then the Big Dig comes and builds the largest use, uses the largest use of slurry wall technology. The simple graphics kind of give you an idea. The slurry walls are retention walls, first and foremost. They are holding back the earth and keeping out the water while the tunnel's being built. But in addition, they are also holding up, the slurry walls are holding up the central artery. The elevated highway's original foundations were knocked out from underneath it, and all the load of the traffic and the, and the structure, the superstructure, was transferred to the slurry walls. And the first tunnels opened up, the slurry walls were in place already. They built them in 10 foot increments for years and years with special equipment. And the equipment varied depending on the contractor. Clamshells like this, massive machines that were developed by the French downtown and right by South Station. This was built by a German company to fit underneath the elevated highway where they had to dig these slurry walls. And the augers, the, 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 these are the most effective probably, it, grinding down, digging down that, that 10 foot trench, three feet wide, filling it with betonite, a clay that kept the water in the hole, but kept the hole from collapsing in on itself. And voila, they, on top of the slurry walls, the, the rusted steel is the new steel, the green is the old central artery from the 50s, Look what they did, they cut out all of the bents, all of, the, all of the, the supports, the columns holding up the elevated highway. And that's when the load transfer took place from the elevated highway to the slurry walls. And this is what it looked like. If you look closely off to the right, you can see it looks like the elevated highway is levitating almost. Everything now is on the, the slurry wall. So this highway was made safer. Boston's in a seismic zone. It was made safer with the transfer of weight front to the slurry walls. All of the big dig goes down to bedrock, wherever it is. It's about 120 feet down in Boston, but everything was founded on, on that bedrock, including the slurry walls, especially the slurry walls. So here's a shot of the tunnel. For years, it was empty until everything was lined up and all the contracts had finished. But while it was being built, I went out to West Virginia. The big dig bought this tunnel the use of it, the rights to it, an abandoned highway tunnel from the 1950s. It went through a, a mountain in West Virginia and never in the world had anyone anywhere on a massive scale done studies in a tunnel about tunnel ventilation and fires and opportunities to upgrade that and make it safer. Because anything that happens in a tunnel is exacerbated by, by the confines of the tunnel. And they start off small. When I was there, it was a small fire and quickly over the years, they grew these fires to look like and simulate uh, semis colliding. And the idea was what kind of ventilation will keep the public safe? And it was determined that these jet fans were the safest pieces of equipment to remove the exhaust because in a tunnel a fire, it's the smoke that will kill the, 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 the people stuck in the tunnel. And these jet fans were able to, with a thousand degree temperatures, still keep operating to get the heat, to get the exhaust, to get the flames under control. So we actually were able to use some jet fans. We were wondering if we were gonna be able to deploy them. And the Boston Fire Department had to, they had to buy the equipment, which the big dig bought for them, to operate and to, and to run the, the fire protection inside of these tunnels. So much so they took a 55 gallon drum, filled it with oil and did their own West Virginia tunnel fire test before the, they, they were, would permit the tunnels to be open. And then who knew, but very shortly after all, all that, that, that testing, the Seattle Mariners had taken a beating at Fenway, were on their way to the airport and their bus caught on fire and the ventilation system kicked into gear. It could create hurricane-like winds at 75 miles an hour. It lifted the heat 
it lifted the flames and it lifted the smoke so that Boston Fire Department personnel could get right next to the, the vehicle, the bus in this case on fire and deal with it. The operations control center, again, one of the most advanced in its time with sensors in the roadbed, cameras, lasers to, to detect overhead vehicles approaching, state of the art. And it was wizardry at the time, more common today, but at the time it was a remarkable feat to have all that electronics uh, working to, sit, to make the traffic and the, and the traveling public safe. Ventilation buildings, though. Speaking of ventilation buildings, there were eight of them built as part of the big dig. This is one of them. Each one of them looks entirely different than the other. This is in the downtown of, of, of Boston. The elevated highway was blocking this from the north end, but when the highway came down, the designers and architects knew that this building was gonna be quite visible from historic North End. So they used the brick and the granite that you see all throughout the North End. It's a 300 car parking garage. It's 50,000 square feet of office space. It's retail space where there's now a farmer's market. It's a subway station and it's a ventilation building. Right in the downtown. Here are the foundations of that ventilation building going through the Orange Line platform. And this building right here, where you see 17A3, this square, that building was owned by Boston Edison. They, were, they refused to give up the land permanently. So the Big Dig was forced to build its ventilation building way below ground, very expensive, build its shafts almost 300 feet high. But look what the owners of the property did. They wrapped the building with the Intercontinental Hotel, a four or five star hotel, multi-million dollar condominiums, and inside of this ventilation building, if you can believe it, is this premier hotel, banquet rooms. I think it's a, it's a great use of space and we should have done more of that on the big dig. This old trestle bridge is, was, it's really a train bridge designed as a, as, a, as a through truss bridge designed as a highway bridge from the 1950s. No one even knew its name. It was called technically the high bridge and it was replaced by Christian Menz, the designer of the Cable Stay Bridge, which is called the Leonard P. Zakem Bunker Hill Memorial Bridge. Uh, and bureaucrats love long names, don't they? Most people just call it the Zakem. But he loves pyramids and obelisks. And you can see he brings his, his very European designs to downtown Boston and shook up Boston's brick and, and granite culture. The, the bridge is the widest cable stay bridge in the world, all sorts of complexities to it. It was asymmetrical and it, it, it had to be built with continuation, business continuation with the elevated highway operating. So that impacted its final design. You can see that white spine in the middle of the bridge being built. That was, it would, they would have preferred to put the cables off to the sides but they were forced to bring it down the spine just so they could get underneath that highway and keep it operating while they built this magnificent bridge. 116 major cables, two lanes are cantilevered off to the side, making it asymmetrical. And this was Mother's Day. They had an opening on Mother's Day to let people walk across it, kind of a wonderful tradition. They called it the Mother's Day Massacre though, because the Boston Celtics and the building right next to the bridge had a late tip off on national TV. Bruce Springsteen sings Thunder Road and the bridge opens up. Not really. The, the opening of the bridge took place, but it sat empty for years while they finished the highway tunnels down below. And then eventually when the tunnels were finished, traffic traveled over the bridge. And the last component, the last missing link of the Big Dig is in this. My boss on the Big Dig was a three-star general named Bill Flynn. And as a brigadier general, he was in the the Desert Storm operation, uh, which was called the mother of all wars by Saddam Hussein and Bill Flynn called this the, the mother of all interchanges. And you can see in, in Kansas in a big square state in all this country, there'd be 60, 70, 80, 100 plus acres of property to maneuver around, not here. Everything is piled up into one mess in the middle. I-90 and I-93 meeting here, that's about 300,000 vehicles a day, not to mention Amtrak trains, commuter rail trains, all of this to say 15 feet below rolling trains, we jacked tunnels underneath the railroad tracks to make sure that the trains kept running. Strangely, 
the big dig, a highway project depended on the rail system during its construction. And inside the left, the purple pit is a jacking pit. The ground was frozen underneath the rail lines while the tunnel was being built in that pit. And then when it was all said and done, the ground underneath the rail lines was 11 degrees Fahrenheit. The, pet, the, the jacking pit in the purple there, that's, that's where the, the tunnel was built and then pushed out of. And the tunnel moved about, I think it was about 20 inches, three feet, uh, uh, an eight hour shift as they made their way towards the Ted Williams tunnel. And you can see in the upper top there, the, right next to the United States Post Office, that, that square, that red square is a jacking pit. Three tunnels in total were jacked out of pits and underneath the rail lines to connect to tunnels on the other side that were immersed tube tunnel sections like the Ted Williams tunnel, except not, except different. They were concrete. Uh, they couldn't be brought up from Bethlehem Steel Shipyard in Baltimore, Maryland because of the low lying bridges off to the left the Northern Avenue Bridge, the Congress Street Bridge, the Summer Street Bridge, it, it, it prohibited the uh, using of steel. So on location and to pass over the Red Line subway, they stabilized the soil, one of the largest soil stabilization projects, 690,000 cubic yards of, of, of Portland grout shot into the ground with jets to solidify and make a solid block of stable material. That's all that yellow. And that acted as the interface between the jack tunnels and the immersed tube tunnel sections. That was done as a way to, originally they were gonna do a, a different pass through here. And then they realized the soil is so unstable, even more than we thought. They went to Tokyo and learned how the Japanese were stabilizing the runways at Tokyo International Airport, came back, applied that technology and then built this. This is the, the, one of the largest holes ever built in construction. It's, you can fit the Empire State Building in it on its side. It's 1,200 feet long. The soil mix wall is not slurry. And they built basically a shipyard, a dry dock. And four sections of the mass pike were built in it and floated out. Here you can see some of the sections, the big gray slab there. Weighs more than a Titanic, more than a battleship. Literally, it's now with these big yellow canisters on the top, they're putting water in that to keep it down so it does have that negative buoyancy again. They release the water, the sections float. They use global positioning systems again, brought them over the top of the red line subway and lowered them down into position, dammed it back up and built two more for a total of six. And these sections rest across this very, very small body of water. This is only 280 feet but it was a billion and a half dollars to, to do everything that we're talking about. The jack tunnels, the immersed tube tunnel sections, casting basin, and everything resting on these columns. These are subaqueous subterranean columns going down to bedrock. Remember, we're always looking for bedrock. And these concrete tunnel sections rest on top of those columns over straddling the red line subway in all that really weak material the blue clay, the, the historical fill, the glacial till. Did you see off to the left here though, see the deep soil mix? See how much they, they shot into the ground there to stabilize that soil? So in the end, this is the last link. And this is where a lot of the problems, a lot of the costs, a lot of the scheduling issues came to head as the project was wrapping up. And Boston, because of this project, especially because of the Ted Williams Tunnel and the I-90 component has brought life to the Seaport District that was pretty much like tumbleweed and, and, and abandoned warehouses. The Silver Line subway has a, I call it a subway, I wish it were, but the transit system has been a huge boon and is wildly successful to its detriment. The tunnel opened up and we thought 30,000 people were going to show up and uh, the Boston Globe estimated 800,000 people came through the tunnel to, to pass through it and see it before traffic. The park underneath the elevated highway is 27 acres. The Big Dig contributed 150 in total, but these 27 acres really stole the show and that really allowed Boston to transform itself. I would say return itself back to its, its original waterfront city. And you can see, I took these from a parking garage myself over time. And you can see the, the, the highway just disappearing, the construction zones, 
and eventually we're left with, with open space and parks. And those 27 off and on ramps from the old elevated were reduced down to half that. So there's much less disruption as, as the tunnel passes through Boston. And historical sight lines. I mean, Queen Elizabeth read the Declaration of Independence from the old state house down there. And that turning around, looking back, would be a view of the ocean. So these historical connections were, were, were restored. And one of my favorite parts of the Big Dig Parks is this one. Uh, the botanical garden that was going to be there, built by the Horticultural Society, never materialized. They didn't come up with the money. And it, it left an opportunity for the Horticultural Society to plant. And it, it's, it's more like Frederick Law Olmsted in the meadows in Central Park. It's more of a calming, beautiful landscape that's very simple because they didn't have the money. And it turned out, I think, to be one of the more elegant pieces of the, of the downtown and the parks. So in, in, in wrapping up, I, I just like to say, you know, Spectacle Island, the Boston Harbor area, the, 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 the waterfront, it, it has become Boston again. Uh, personally, I spent a lot of time out in the harbor on a boat. I row out to Spectacle Island where the 100 acres of parkland has been created on a city dump that was out of Spectacle. And it's become remarkable. Now, remember, this project was built by two men who hate cars like people hate evil. So it was never really about, believe it or not, the highway. It was just to get rid of it. There's still congestion. There's still, there's always gonna be congestion. And I believe Boston, early, early on, Boston has been about tunnels. Uh, the Blue Line Tunnel was one of the first tunnels in the world to carry a train underwater. The first subway in the United States was in Boston. We have a wonderful history of innovation in Boston. The first email went out, the first telephone call. Uh, Boston is an innovative city and it takes that to create this kind of innovation. And the big dig is, is that writ large. So it's been an honor for me to work with Michael Dukakis on promoting America's infrastructure. I, I, I went out though, before I started working with Michael Dukakis, I bought this old car because I thought to myself, you know, this is, this is, uh, America needs to address its infrastructure, all of it, not, not just silos of it, like highways or dams or schools or parks or solid waste. It needs to look at everything at once and build the right infrastructure. We only have so many resources to build. We have to get it right now so that the, the, the future is brighter. So the future can, can deliver all that we hope for it. This, I think, is... is uh, it, to me, this old car struck me as a metaphor for America's infrastructure. So I bought this 1949 Hudson. I said, America's infrastructure is as old and rusty and energy defunct as my 1949 Hudson. I spent two years, 20,000 miles. And when you buy a death trap and commit yourself to sponsors that you're going to drive it and say, America's infrastructure is like my car. I, I thought, what's a good Catholic boy going to do? I went to my priest, my, my monk. Uh, down in New York who married me and I asked him to bless my, my vehicle. This is down by Penn Station in New York. And after the popular, uh, I headed out on the road. And I'd like to share a little clip with you if you'll let me uh, about this trip and we can take questions afterwards. America's roadways are riddled with potholes. These holes they're a result of broken politics. In America, government, it's what we do together. And infrastructure, that's what we build together. But in America, our infrastructure is as old and rusty and energy defunct as my 1949 Detroit lead sled. America's first lowrider, a Hudson Commodore 8. Seeking the hearts and minds of Americans, I set out on a two-year odyssey, a 20,000-mile-long road trip. Method acting, the part of broken infrastructure, I steered my rolling metaphor, named Mrs. Martin, westward out of Boston, in hopes of circumnavigating the nation's lower 48. To keep the show on the road, my mechanic, my teacher, my friend, Dr. Per Christensen joined me. Together we drove into the soul of the world's greatest built world. 
In the end, we found it bold and beautiful, but ultimately broken. The pillars of society, government, schools, hospitals, rest upon infrastructural foundations. Seeking to discover the strengths and the weaknesses of the nation's foundations, Pear and I set out to lay hands on every category of the country's infrastructure. Rolling with truckers and the traveling public, we traversed the nation's four million mile net of byways and highways. We spanned the greatest, the busiest, and the most structurally deficient of our 670,000 plus bridges. Mrs. Martin challenged and lost her races against the iron horses of the world's mightiest industrial rail system, 141,000 miles of steel wheels on steel rails. We rode the limited ways of public transit systems. With futurists, we sought the vision of high-speed rail. We sailed with crews out of home ports and into the 12,000 miles of inland waterways. With pilots, we lifted off the most impressive runways and touched down in the smallest of our 5,000 airports. We ventured into the brightness and the darkness of our energy grid, which led us to the dams and levees of power where we witness the dangers of imprisoned water that slakes our thirst and feeds our food. Sanitation engineers enlightened us to the potential of reclamation and the damnation of disposal. Finally, we sought peace in our national, state, and local parks. We were welcomed into the home of our collective mind, the most important building of all, the public schoolhouse. The cracks in our concrete the rust in our metal, they are the repercussions of the failure of governance. We've come to believe that more powerful than an iron worker's torch, or the carpenter's saw, or the plumber's wrench, is the cast of your vote. Thank you. Ian, thank you. That was as enjoyable as it was informative and that was a wonderful conclusion yeah thank you carl so we'll we'll now turn this over for some questions so yes we have many we have many i don't know if we'll get, have time to get to them all um so i'll just start with two related questions what should pete Buttigieg be dead be pushing for um to fix our crumbling infrastructure what do you think needs to be fixed first and a related question, what's the solution for our infrastructure issues? Higher taxes, P3s, or just a, commit, or just a commitment to it? Uh, the second part of that question, all three, absolutely. It's gonna take everything. Uh, the, the P3 model is appropriate, but only in some places, certainly not every. The, the idea of, of taxes, we, we are simply not investing like we need to be. So we need to double, quadruple down on taxes for infrastructure and up that investment. We, we've gone off a cliff as far as investing. Uh, we've not, we're not investing as the rest of the world, especially China, seems to be doubling down on their investments, building high-speed rail, it, magnificent airports and uh, air systems, as well as every other mode of infrastructure. And, and you know, with Pete, I, I think Mayor Pete's got just such a remarkable opportunity. Uh, the, the Department of Transportation is the construction arm of, of the U.S. government, in my opinion. DOD, yes, of course, they're, they're, they're brilliant at, at building. But really, in the civic mind, DOT, Department of Transportation, is the construction arm, the infrastructure arm. So anybody with an a innovative mind and a commitment towards infrastructure that wants to change the, the thinking can do it with a president who's supporting him at DOT. Uh, the, think marine, think of trains, think of planes, think of ships, think of, of even pipelines that carry materials are considered part of DOT's initiative. Uh, it's, it's a magnificent construction infrastructure department. And I think we need to start looking at it like that. I think most people look at the Department of Transportation and think, oh, they, they're in charge of the highways. And that's where they stop thinking about it. That's the retail thinking. But from a commitment to total transformation, it's going to probably start at DOT. They're the ones that have the, the purse strings and the money to invest in other forms of infrastructure. Uh, for example, maybe we should skip 
steel wheels on steel rails and build Hyperloop. Uh, that's the kind of thing Pete can, can focus on. Maybe, maybe we can spend a lot less money on gray infrastructure like roads and bridges if we just jack up the internet. And if we're controlling gas and fluids and oils through pipelines and calling that a DOT initiative, well, then why the hell wouldn't the internet and why wouldn't fiber optics be that? So I think after the plague, we're all going to be looking at, do we need to get on a plane? Do we need to get on a, in a car? Do we, you know, congestion's coming with, with the vaccinations are, are, are going to be people traveling around again. And that's exciting, but we can't go back to that old thinking. And I think this, I've been watching infrastructure and hoping for something magnificent to come. And I think out of the darkness of the plague, we're gonna see some real change in how we build. But we have to get the infrastructure component right because when you build infrastructure, you're building it for the next 50 to 100 years. So it's, a, it's doubly critical right now to get this right and start off from this point today on the right path. And I think Buttigieg is quite capable of, of that. Yeah. How does sea level rise impact cities like Boston and New York City and all of their tunnels? Oh, my God. I mean, high tide is a downtown event in Miami now. The, the, the problem with, with sea rise is it's, it's disproportionate. And New England is getting hit very hard. I don't think people understand that the biggest change in climate and sea rise is happening in Rhode Island. It's happening in Massachusetts. It's happening in Maine. And that, I'm talking about the lower 48. Those are the, the states that are hit the hardest right now. So Boston has to deal with this. And people are even thinking, I, I own a, a condominium at South Station in an old uh, leather shoe factory built in 1899. Uh, the big dig, uh, you know, the ocean's about 500 feet away. And I worry about that because it's, it's happening. When, when dumpsters start floating down the, the street in the seaport district across from me, at high tide, during these king tides, during storms, you know there's more trouble coming. So it, it affects almost all major cities because where are the major cities? They're right on the edge of the ocean where land meets water. Think New York, think Philadelphia, think Boston, think Washington, D.C. even. Think San Francisco, think Los Angeles, mm -hmm. think Seattle. These are all cities that are going to be greatly impacted by sea rise. Right. Okay. So, Bent Flybears, I totally don't know how to pronounce that last name, identified an iron law, iron law of mega projects over budget, over time, over and over again. He says that one of the major reasons that successful mega projects on time, on budget, delivering the promised benefits, are an outlier in what he calls the break fix model of mega project management. It seems like the Big Dig is a perfect example. Amazing and engineering solutions delivered to make up for unanticipated challenges. However, in order to transition to a low carbon economy, we will meet, need more mega projects, especially in the areas of electrical transmission, storage, district energy systems, deep geothermal drilling and energy exploitation, and large scale carbon capture and storage. What are some lessons you see from the big dig that could break the iron law of mega projects for these new and necessary projects? The truth. <laughs> it's, it's so often overlooked. Uh, the big dig violated its sacred, I would call it sacred, uh, its, its relationship with the Federal Highway Administration. Writ large, the interstate system, think of it because the big dig is a, a product of that. The interstate system is really a volunteer organization. It's a, a volunteer initiative. The states all provided the land. The federal government provided the money. It was a federal initiative. And that partnership has been in existence since 1916 as a very serious and very committed partnership. And the Big Dig, through its state leadership, through uh, got, went, went off the rails and was lying, the, the Big Dig, if you can believe this, project management was lying about the cost of the project to its federal partners. Uh, the, the, the budget landed on the Secretary of Transportation, Rodney Slater's desk uh, in, in, 19, in 2000, I believe, and it hit with a thud. And then maybe 10 minutes later, it seemed the realities, the, the Wall Street Journal had done an investigative piece and blew open the doors that said the costs were actually billions of dollars more. My point being, 
we have to be honest with ourselves that the public has to get smarter and be, be uh, aware of what these costs are. And, and we, we need to stop focusing on the cost. And I know that's, that sounds absurd, but these initiatives are unpredictable. The Big Dig's budget was $2.6 billion. It was supposed to finish up in 1998. It turned out to be a $15 billion project. Some say $24 billion if you consider the carrying costs. And where, 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 where do we finish? 2008, it went from Reagan to Obama, six, six different presidential administrations. That's, it's absurd. Uh, so speed is cost. If we don't build quickly, we're going to be we're going to be paying and dragging these projects out for longer, longer periods. But how do we break this cycle? That that is the the simplest answer I can come up with is that it's we we need to from the very beginning be honest about the cost of these projects. Uh, it's considered suicide for a project sometimes to say what the real costs are because they're afraid that the public will turn it down. I think that's foolery and that the public is much smarter than they're given credit for. And if it's explained to them that there's a source of funding and we'll get more of it if we need it, but here's the initiative. But you know, we're, we're failing. And I think this really matters to the, to the question. We are not building up the know-how, the, the intelligence that we need in our state organizations. We've, we've, subcontracted all that out. We have management consultants and consultants uh, driving these projects now. Think of the Second Avenue subway, 10 years, $5 billion to build two miles of subway. That's preposterous. The Big Dig depended too much on its subcontractors, on its management consultant, Bechtel and Parsons Brinkerhoff. The smartest people in the room were Bechtel and Parsons. They outgunned the state. There were 47 of us. I was one of the state people there were 1500 of the of the of the contractor and the, you you have to have that intelligentsia inside of the the project inside of the commonwealth or the states uh makeup the, 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 there are these state organizations think mbta think turnpike authority think any organization building needs to have that in-house smart to to manage these projects better too and, it, and they'll be they'll be built more quickly i believe right we, uh, there are several questions about the project management. Um, so could you could you speak to, you know, stories about project management and lessons learned, and how how was the focus on the project design requirements maintained? You know, um, I, I think because it, 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 we're so limited on time right now, I think the yeah. simplest way to look at it is there were forty seven people in the state, there were maybe eight people in the federal government that were managing this project that had 5,000 hard hats, 1,200 engineers and management consultants running the show. And, and believe me, they were running the show. So that's what I mean by control. The state never really had control. And that's where I think it fell down. Not only that, but this was a low, this was built on the, on the low bid process, uh, you know, bid it and build it. And that's yeah. such, a, a, such a fatal flaw because here are the management consultants working very closely with contractors that they work with all over the world, all over the United States. They know each other very well. And the, 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 the wolf is in the hen house in that case. You know, you, you, can't, you, can't have, uh, you can't have that kind of constructive project management without the, the, the wherewithal and the know-how. And we, we just didn't have it in the state level. And, it takes years, decades, maybe to build that up, but that needs to start immediately. I think the states need to have much more investment in their staff so they can manage these projects and they cannot ship the management out to management consultants and contractors. I worked on the high-speed rail project in, in California. I spent over a year in Sacramento and it's a magnificent project, 800 miles of high-speed rail between Los Angeles and San Francisco. I mean, this is a dream of mine to be on the largest public works project again. And, and it's a 65 to $85 billion project, depending on who you're talking to. They've been at it for 10 years, 10 years, and they're not 1% done. I mean, that, that, yeah. that, uh, that is an epic failure. Uh, and we, we have all the technology, we have the ability, we just can't get the politics right. And we can't, we, until we get the politics right, we are going to be depending on our internet dial-up connections uh, because we're not getting it done and we will not see improvement. 
uh, we won't reduce carbon footprints, we won't re reduce travel times, we won't be innovative until we break this cycle. And I'm really fearful that this division in Washington, uh, I, I mean this, Barney Frank, I, I give him credit, he says, well, government's what we do to, together. And if that's the case, infrastructure is what we build together and we're not gonna build anything. We will not build anything significant. We will not have mega projects in this country return until we figure this governance issue out. Right. That's what Pete Buttigieg can do, maybe. Sorry. <laughs> I've got a more of a local question for you. How can a city like Springfield here in Western Mass consider a similar solution to their highways? Well, that's brilliant. You know, I'm, I'm amazed being out here in Western Mass. I'm new to living out here. I'm very familiar with the area, but I'm in Southampton, Northampton. I'm blown away by how New York influenced we are out here in Massachusetts. Uh, that's due to 91. And that's where Springfield lives on 91. The other confluence of influence is from 90. And these are desire lines that were rail lines before, but New York and Boston kind of intersect right here in Springfield. And I think Springfield is sitting on a wonderful opportunity to build on the Connecticut River connection, the river that we killed in the 1700s and, and destroyed all the salmon. It's it just, it just mind blowing how our, our thinking, our economy, our consumption orientation is destroying our ability to sustain our environment that we really ultimately <laughs> depend on. And I think Springfield's in an interesting place where more people are gonna be coming west. I think the, the confluence of rails and highways and water, it's all there. And I think Springfield needs to reimagine itself, but like so many cities, it kind of destroyed its own downtown to save itself and it, and it didn't save itself. All right, here's another one. According to data from the Texas Transportation Institute, from 1982 to 2014, total vehicle miles traveled in Boston increased from 40,000 to 78,000, and total delay due to traffic congestion increased from 60,000 to 155,000 hours. In other words, while vehicle miles traveled increased by about 95%, total delay increased by 158%. However, it is true that traffic delays to the airport have been reduced and remain reduced. How should planners think about road projects in the context of total road congestion versus congestion on specific routes? How could project planners avoid over-promising benefits while better targeting specific benefits? Wow, that's loaded. You know, uh, to, to boil it down, uh, the, the major issue in Boston, if you can, it feels like a hundred years ago, but before the plague, the, the biggest issue was congestion. And that's all anyone talked about was congestion. And it was crippling Boston. We'd built this magnificent tunnel system. The, the, the city of Boston proper was, was doing okay, but it was all the metropolitan area influences from Rhode Island to New Hampshire that was really creating havoc. But to me, it looks like we, we can't continue to bring cars into the, into the downtowns. It's that simple. We need to build systems like this rail link that Michael Dukakis has, has been pushing for forever, which unloads the burden on the highways and transfers it to heavy rail or the light rail or to other systems. And it's gonna be upon employers to, to, who want to create that energy in the downtown of Boston to stagger work, to work from home, to, to everyone's got to contribute to the, the total demand put on this antique infrastructure. But what's, what's so obvious, so plainly obvious, and I took this trip around the country because I felt like as a writer, as a journalist, as someone writing about these issues, I should go out and see it. And I wanted to see, is this critical infrastructure story really uh, just sensational or is it real? And I am, I am, I think almost every city faces what Boston is facing. Some like Springfield, not as much on the grand scale, but the demands on the antique systems that we have neglected and allowed to dilapidate uh, speak for themselves. And our, our, our unwillingness to invest in infrastructure means we go to the default, which is your bicycle. And I mean that, like micro mobility is probably gonna be more of a solution than the great next mega project uh, in cities. And moving around is gonna look a lot like it used to probably in some ways, but I don't think that's a 
bad thing necessarily. I've written extensively about roads, many books about roads. And I never until recently thought of them as, that's not a road, that's a public access. That's a big corridor for what could be anything. And I think we have to reimagine the streetscapes if we're gonna talk about really changing New York City or changing Boston. Mm -hmm. I, I can do one more, Carl, or we can um, Well, it. you know what I think we should do? I think we should let people go, but if people would like to hang around for a little bit, perhaps Dan would answer a few questions. So I'll let people go, but in closing, I'd like to again thank Dan for a lecture that was really a lecture about history that informs the future. And so in gratitude, we can look forward to the arrival of our famous BCT water bottle in the mail. <laughs> Thank can, you, to me. I, <laughs> and I can assure you, yeah, that's, that's a legendary <laughs> gift. Uh, but uh, uh, I can assure you that once uh, uh, the virus has abated, that we'll invite you to the building. Oh, thank you, Carl. So that'll be great to see you in person. And I also like to thank both Architecture and LARP for helping to make this night possible. And I alert you all to the next BCT lecture on March 29th. It's going to be on building commissioning with Wesley Stanhope, who's the founder of Building Evolution. Thank you and good evening. But if you'd like to hang out for a while, be fine. We've got a lot of people hanging out, Dan. It could yeah. be a long <laughs> evening here. Bring it on. I've got an empty house here. <laughs> um, yeah, perhaps at this point, uh, people can just ask, just unmute themselves and ask their own questions. I think that sure, will be, be great. a little more sure. dynamic. Hey, Dan. This is Hi. Doug Marshall. I'm a member of the campus planning staff at the university. And I was actually on the uh, part of the Big Dig staff for five years in the early 90s. Um, I recognize I, I your a, name, Doug. Yeah, I had a question that I uh, wanted to ask. And that is that the project was created and funded back when Congress awarded pork. And in the mid 90s, uh, Newt Gingrich uh, basically outlawed those kinds of projects. And uh, Congress, to my knowledge, since then, Congress really doesn't uh, horse trade and allow pork projects to be thrown into legislation. So what, to what extent do you think that's inhibiting our ability to get these kind of good infrastructure projects rather than things like the infamous bridge to nowhere that was gonna happen in Alaska. That's an excellent point because the, the, the idea of pork just turns everyone uh, sour except for those receiving it, I guess. The, the, what, what I've come to Doug is that uh, I, I, didn't, I never thought of myself as a federalist, but I, I, I am. After looking at George Washington's initiative right after he became the president of the United States, he built the national road. It was a highway, a, they called it an artificial uh, road because the real roads were in the water. And this artificial road traveled east and west and it was an initiative of his. He had uh, many projects that he wanted to build but he chose this one because he, was cons he, he knew that the Spaniards and the British out in the western parts of the country would, would take over if we didn't build a road, a smooth way, he called it, out there. And I look at that kind of federal initiative and that kind of federal thinking as critical to our future. I uh, think Transcontinental Railroad, that was Abraham Lincoln during, during the Civil War launched that construction project. And it did so much to unite this country physically after the war and after his assassination. But you look at the Panama Canal, that lowered the cost of of goods in California and increase the cost of real estate because it became much more likely to get out there. And, and these projects, these big initiatives, these big federal projects that we need, we still need, uh, won't happen with the devolution that looks like uh, 
I don't want to pay for it. I, I'm not, we're not going to do it. Uh, the states cannot build these projects, these big ones, these really important ones on their own. And, and, and today we're, we're, we're looking at not just a, a bridge across the Golden Gate, which is the opening of San Francisco Bay. Uh, we're, we're looking at uh, all infrastructure. My point being, we used to look at infrastructure as something like, you know, if we can do it, we need to do it. If we can build this, it was the engineering was the limitation. Now we can build almost anything, except we can't build anything at all because we can't get to agreement at the federal level. And these initiatives, the Federal Highway Administration, the Federal Interstate Program, it's called the Dwight D. Eisenhower National System of Interstate and Defense Highways. I mean, the interstate system, if it hadn't happened under Eisenhower, it never would have happened. We would have been dealing with the U.S. routes, these black and white shielded highways with lots of access, with dangerous crossroads, with inconsistencies, with lack of uniformity. And the, the concept of the, of the federalism, the federal aspects of, of infrastructure, is it allows for the tough decision making of, I'm sorry, Idaho, you don't get this, Utah does, because it makes more sense for the entire country. Everyone's thinking about their driveway and maybe their state, but they're not thinking about the country. And when you don't have that, that global look at the country, uh, that, that end to end, you're, you're gonna sacrifice piecemeal improvements for states and cities that can afford it. And you're never gonna get the, the, the connections you need. And, and the interstate is something I'm very familiar with. I've written about it. Imagine Wyoming, like they can't, it's one of the most, I think it's the most least populated state in America. There's fewer people in Wyoming than all of Boston. I'm talking about just Boston, not, not the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. They can't build I-90 across that state, but they did. And those kind of connections like Seattle and Boston are connected by I-90. They never would have had that connection if it weren't for the federal largesse allowing these other states to come along. And that's the sacrifice we're making by following this this uh, Newt Gingrich theory of let the states figure it out or libertarianism, which is I've got my money, you go find yours. You know, th this, 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 this country, Washington was concerned about the partisanship and parties he thought would rip apart the country and we're seeing it. It's just a question of, can we bring it back? And I, I don't mean to be too romantic about this, but in my opinion, infrastructure is what can help the country come back together again. I really believe uh, an internet that was labeled and and was was packaged as a as a as a benefit for rural areas as well as as urban areas red and blue could be something that would bring people back around again we we need to know that our government can deliver we need to know that when we spend money on a project you know this is back back to a question earlier about funding if we if, if the people are educated properly about what the benefits of a project are, let the project go forward on its own merit or not, maybe it shouldn't be built, but the initiatives have to be public and the public is not oh, a part of it. Hey, Dan. Hey there. Yeah, this is Bill Mayer. I worked on the uh, project hey, for 19 years. How you doing? I'm good. I haven't seen you in a long time. Good to see I you. Yeah, I've been retired for a while. Good for you. Um, yeah, I was area design manager in the downtown area for uh, quite a few years. Um, my question is, um, and kind of uh, to the, the point that you were just making, has there been a post uh, economic evaluation of the be overall benefit of the project to Boston? Kind of a business case that would look at, uh, you know, all the development, uh, improvement of property values, um, saving of time, benefit of uh, lower air pollution, you know, number of things like that. Has any of that been packaged together to kind of make that business case for doing things like this? Because I think it's cost effective in the long run. That's an excellent point, Bill. And and we're both we're both uh, biased, I think, probably because of our association with the project, but. I think the people who built the project understand its impact more than most. And I, I don't know of a single definitive comprehensive report that looks at the total assessment of the cost of the project versus the value added to Boston. The return on investment has been phenomenal. The, the, the big dig has delivered in ways you can't even 
comprehend as far as the seaport district. Uh, there's three pentagons worth of, of commercial real estate that could be built along that seaport district now. Uh, and the downtown, I, I own property in the downtown. Uh, it's a different, it's a, an entirely different city. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the idea of innovation, you know, think of all the universities in, in Boston. Uh, it's, it's become an even more attractive city because of this very, I think, uh, noble project. The, the construction was challenged by the confines of the project and the politics, but the, the return on investment, it's, it's, it's something that really galls me that we never during the big dig took serious consideration into what the effects were gonna be economically. We didn't even record the lessons learned really. There's a brochure floating around somewhere about lessons learned, but it got so dumbed down that it was useless. But, but no one has, and maybe I, I should be one to, to blame because I'm not taking this up right now, but we absolutely must look at the value of these mega projects that we do instead of just cut and run to the next one. There's never been a really comprehensive look at the project specifically and what it could have done better, but even more so what, what the impacts were for the city. Uh, some cases like the elevated highway in the 1950s was a detriment and, a, and a, it was a liability the big dig has been a boon for the for the entire city, and I would argue, property values in New Hampshire and Rhode Island and Western Mass are impacted by that project. Although the big dig, and you must admit, Bill, sucked all the money away from Western Mass and kept it in Boston for for a good twenty years. Hi. Um, can you hear me? We yeah. can, Steve. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I I have a. Actually, two questions. So one is actually related to what you just said. So Springfield, so totally agree with you about the potential of Springfield. And it has the viaduct that, you know, goes basically cuts the downtown from the river. So every time that I hear people mentioning, you know, we should put that underground or whatever, the two words are big dig. And then that kind of, you know, ends the conversation. But how does that, how do we, um, and actually this is related to the last point, like how does one sort of prove the economic viability of such projects to not just pay for themselves, but to have this, it's like, it's like unclogging your arteries. But I'm very curious about how, especially since you said you're out here in Western Mass now. So the other one is the, um, I guess it's also a question about the high speed rail or any kind of rail that connects Springfield to Boston, which has always been a challenge primarily because one of the reasons that Springfield connects to New York City is that it can basically follow the Connecticut River Valley, which um, doesn't go to New Haven, but the valley goes to, the Rift Valley basically goes to New Haven and then along the coast. But there is no such connection from across the state because of all the crags. So have you given any thought to, you know, that about how we could connect better by rail. I don't know if you followed that at all either. Uh, I, I have, and I'm, uh, it breaks my heart that we're not doing anything with rail, in, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. We're getting new rolling stock on Accela. Big deal. Uh, we're still on the same 1800s track lines. Uh, and th that's what broke my heart about the, the project out in California. I mean, here's this wonderful opportunity to build a rail, high-speed rail between San Francisco and Los Angeles, eliminate a lot of, of domestic uh, intrastate air commerce between Los Angeles and San Francisco where there's a huge carbon burn rate, like un unimaginable. Uh, but, but to Springfield's point, think of, of Seattle. Let's just, because of time, we'll just focus on, on a success that, that came from the big dig. My, my publisher was like, why is the book selling out in Seattle? <laughs> and the, the, the big dig was selling out in Seattle because they were thinking about doing the same thing. The Alaska Way Viaduct, the concrete viaduct was gonna come down. It actually did come down in an earthquake, part of it. And they brought the rest of it down after they dug a huge tunnel with a massive boring machine, the largest boring machine in the world, 57 feet in diameter, digging underneath this viaduct. They dig the tunnel, they tear down the viaduct. Suddenly Puget Sound is a part of, of Pike's Market and the downtown of Seattle. Magnificent. Why aren't more people doing this? Uh, San Francisco, the Embarcadero fell during an earthquake. Whitehurst Freeway in Potomac, it blocks the downtown of Georgetown from the Potomac River. These mistakes from the past have, have just begun to be corrected. And I think 
it's so interesting you bring this up. The fastest way to kill a project is to invoke the big dig. So to Bill's point, we have to look at the cost of the big dig and the value that it contributed to it to shut up the, the, the controversy around cost. Uh, suddenly costs don't look that bad when you think of Afghanistan and Iraq, when you think of the bailouts in the 9, 2008, when you think of the, the bailout for the plague. Uh, we're kind of lost. You know, it used to be that's B with a billion. That was a big deal. And now it's like, oh, you know, billions are nothing now. Uh, I think the, the costs have, are something that can be easily gotten over if you're smart about it, but it takes a lot of hard work. And I am guilty of not putting more pencil to paper to get those figures on what the return on investment is. But invoking the big dig is the fastest way to kill a project. I was working on the San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge project, a magnificent self anchored suspension bridge that was built. It took 23 years to build this thing, 23 years, uh, too, way, too, way too long. And the result was they called it the big dig in the bay. I, I worked for over a year out there on that project and I couldn't believe I was you know, being plagued by the big dig and that it wasn't being used as a positive. But I think enough time has passed that we in Boston and all I'm talking to the, this, this group of uh, intellectual thought leaders here, it has to come from the the big dig is a is a Massachusetts construct, just like the University of Massachusetts is. And why not UMass lead the way in in analyzing this big dig project? Because uh, Tom Wright, the head of the research, uh, it's the Regional Plan Association of New York, smartest organization I've ever met, where they look at every single mega project built and dissect it because they know that's gonna be either the success or the failure of the next project. So we have to look at the big dig critically and get those numbers out and improve very economically, matter of factly, what the return on investment is. Kind of boring compared to jack tunnels and freezing ground and rats, but it's, it's really critical. And tear down the, the goddamn uh, I-91 in front of Springfield and you will see Springfield take off. All right, well, maybe one more. Justin, you have a question? Great, yeah, I'm glad I got to ask. Um, first of all, Dan, thank you so much. The presentation was just a wealth of knowledge. And coincidentally, uh, the, the Senior Landscape Architecture Studio takes place right at the southern tip of the Rose Kennedy Greenway. So this is all kind of <laughs> lining up. And because of that, I've, I've kept my eyes open for information everywhere, you know, referring to this. And just yesterday, uh, I found this gem. That, uh, <laughs> Thank <laughs> that, you, that Justin. I love that. Secondhand bookstore. So I, I thought you'd get a kick out of that. Um, but, but just in terms of the, the project, um, I was, I was really curious. You mentioned that 65 acres were, were basically leveled for the original elevated highway project. And, and one of the things we've been looking into is kind of the history of redlining in Boston. And much of this area had been either redlined or, or abutted redlined land. Um, for this elevated highway project. So I, I guess I was just wondering, you know, what influences politically, um, you know, cited this project there? Um, who was there and who got displaced by this project? Sure. And, and to be clear on the, on the 65 acres, uh, the Great Fire of 1872 wiped out 65 acres. Uh, in the downtown of Boston, underneath the elevated were 27 acres. But the 93 component went into Somerville, one of the most densely populated cities on earth, like next to Calcutta, and Southeast Expressway into Dorchester, also densely populated. And that horrible highway really just decimated the more than 65 acres up and down. But specifically, uh, the the tell me what your 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 question was again about the uh, landscaping and the architecture. Yeah. So our um, I, I guess just what we've been looking at is kind of the history of redlining in Boston in, in um, kind of the, what is now unconstitutional to, to you know, reserve federal loans for specific races of people. Um, and much of the land in downtown Boston was redlined um, specifically um, for, you know, Italian Americans or African Americans um, weren't able to get loans. So I guess I was wondering if there's any correlation between those people getting displaced um, in this project. Uh, it, it, the, the Big Dig was, again, trying to correct those kind of wrongs. Fred Salvucci, incredibly socially minded and very progressive in his thinking. Not a single home was taken, first of all, on the Big Dig. 
but that was easy because they took all the homes when they built the, the horrible structure in the 50s. Yeah. Uh, some commercial structures were taken. But the, the red line that you're speaking of, it happened. I talked to engineers that were at their mm -hmm. peak in their careers during the 50s and the 60s on the interstate system. And this is all over the country, but it definitely happened in Boston, in downtown. And I'd like to think that the Big Dig did do a lot to correct some of that. But mm -hmm. the, 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 the process used to be, they would send you a notice, you'd be evicted from your home that you owned, you'd be sued, you'd have to go to court and you'd have to petition to keep your home or get a fair sale price on your home. That was the process. And you had to be out because they were bulldozing the home. Thankfully, that can't happen anymore. But the problem is that can't happen anymore and they can't clear paths and they can't clear right of ways. And that's why the train in California has stalled because the wealthy farmers have lawyered up and they're stopping trains from passing through their fields. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a dynamic, complex issue. But with the redlining, boy, they, they, they took the cheapest real estate. So on the surface in the Boston Globe, it made a lot of sense to say, well, we're, we're building this the most economically feasible way possible. We're going into these very low income areas where the, the value of the property is very low. So the public trust, the, the, the money from the public is being spent wisely buying cheapest real estate. But where was that? That was either in a park because the parks were not protected. That was either in a low income neighborhood, like you mentioned, Mattapan, Dorchester, North End, Charlestown, where economically deprived people were, were unable to fight this, this state initiative. And, and that was a horrible thing to realize when you look back at the history of your project and you realize that, that the original roads were, were tightly knit neighborhoods that never should have been, been built through. And this was something, I just wanna mention this really quickly, but Eisenhower, when he was saying, laying out the interstate system, which this is a part of, he never wanted to go into the downtowns. 12% of the urban aspects of the interstate system cost 50% of the total budget. Very rough numbers, but you get the idea. The downtowns, you, the roads get wider because they're more congested. They take up more of the tax base. And then they're going through these, these neighborhoods that cannot defend themselves from these kind of projects. And that's, that's horrific. Uh, Fred Salvucci was very successful. You should look into this more, but Fred Salvucci and a group of people stopped I-95 and it's fascinating. And they took that money like jujitsu. They took that money that was federal highway money and they turned it into transit money. And that really began the initiative of taking transit money out of the federal highway trust fund. But transit is much more friendly, right? Moves more people, does less damage. And the I-95 corridor turned into the orange line going into the city. And Eisenhower knew that if, this, if, these, if these interstate highways went into the cities, it'd be a problem. In Germany, because it was an Autobahn that really inspired him to build the interstate system, he said you know, they had ring roads. So they would go into the cities near them, but then there'd be a road around, a small beltway around a city. The, the highways never went into the downtown. I-95 is a great example if you want to look at this. It goes, everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly of highways happens along I-95. Like in Richmond, they wanted the highway in the downtown. God knows why. Other cities refused it, like Washington, and it went around the city. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Justin. I love your, your, uh, your loft there. It looks like a skunk works in a, in a good yeah, way. I, I hit my head all the time. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Dan, for hanging out for an extra half hour.